this opportunity. Yeah, I mean, you you just uh, heard what what I wrote in in the kind of abstract for this, and so I, I gave myself quite a quite a big task in a way to review a lot of things. Um, and what I'm going to do today is, you know, share my thoughts and insights. So it's not a lot about um, you know specific um, uh, modeling and simulation results. It's uh, it's about uh, what my view is and uh, what the insights that uh, we also in, in Copper Consulting and uh, in, uh, in the initiatives such as EMMC have been collecting about these uh, these topics over the years. So um, um, got quite a few slides on that, but hopefully there will be some time also to discuss. Um, Gabriela has already kindly introduced uh, uh, the, the com my company, Copper Consulting. Um, and so I won't dwell too much on, on, on this slide. Uh, we have been working uh, since 2011 really to identify and bridge the gaps in this uh, materials um, modeling and digitalization ecosystem. And we work with uh, many clients and also uh, with more than in more than 10 European projects. Our services uh, range from insights into the complex landscape of materials modeling, informatics, and digitalization, so market reports and so on, um, and a translation to give advice on materials modeling and digitalization solutions to industry for uh, R&D, um, commercialization of software, for example, to academic uh, institutions that have um, you know, exploitation plans for their software and also in projects impact assessments to analyze the maturity and to improve the impact of materials modeling in your organization. Uh, and uh, on, on the right hand side, uh, more recently also advice on coarse grain modeling. I'll show you something on that and uh, also um, to work in what we call now semantic materials. So to use ontology based uh, modeling to uh, support the integration of data and, and workflows in material science. Here's uh, the, some of the insight reports uh, that uh, we will draw on, for example, on materials modeling in the informatic software markets, uh, but also very importantly on the strategies for industry to engage in materials modeling and on uh, translator activities, both in materials modeling and also in more generally in, in knowledge management as well as business models for materials modeling software. As I said, um, my colleague, uh, Otello Roscione, uh, or, or Otello is a, an expert and in fact, the author of a, uh, an open source uh, code. And uh, we, we're happy to also provide consulting services on that. It's the remote code designed for multi-scale modeling. Uh, providing accurate mapping of post grain structures uh, to atomic coordinates. So um, it matches very well the structural and electronic properties of um, materials, in particular functional and um, you know, ele electronic, for example, organic uh, semiconductor materials. Um, and there's uh, a recent paper on that which shows that indeed coarse grain structures are as good as atomic ones for calculating electronic properties. Um, what you see here is um, such um, organic uh, semiconductor materials and with dopants, and you can see the blue dopants here, um, their uh, position, uh, structure, packing, and so on in the at uh, atomistic model is uh, the same as in the, in the um, coarse grain model, uh, so you don't have any sort of corrections once you do a back mapping from the um, uh, from the uh, 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 coarse grain to the to the atomistic model. So you have the re reversible structures here, and I sorry, I'm just trying to set this up um, in terms of for you to actually um, see see the, uh, the the simulation so I won't take much time on that here is the uh, the atomistic and then uh, you can map this is mapped then to the coarse grained and um, and then um, in, uh, large structures over large time scales can be can be modeled with that and um, 
back mapped into the atomistic structure without any uh, uh, problems in terms of volumes. Uh, this is because the excluded volumes are closely matched due to the anisotropic overlapping uh, beads, electrostatic potentials, and two-body potentials of the, the mode model. Uh, so this it's based on 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 the lamps code and is is uh, very well validated. So um, yeah, that's to start with just some um, actual modeling, um, but uh, there won't be a lot more of of that. I mean, and there are many many other uh, webinars um, and talks on on that. What we want to talk about here is. Uh, the impacts of modeling and also how that uh, works for industry. Um, I've, I've just here um, listed again from um, you know previous work that we've done, a typical impacts of, of materials modeling in terms of faster development, innovation cycles, um, supporting digitalization by digital twins and <clears throat> integration of models into products, which is called product plus. Um, enhanced collaboration and decision making, insights, IP, reduced risk of late stage failure, and predictive science enabling smarter experimentation. Um, just a, a reference to a paper from um, the team at BASF, which is still very much pertinent today, um, that um, the insights and information that is not as easily available otherwise really lead to a number of, of key impacts which I've listed here from that paper and which I also have just been talking about right now. Um, one of them not often uh, you know, known about is intellectual property uh, supporting robust IP claims, but also um, the ability of defensive publishing, meaning that um, intentional and purposeful publication of innovations uh, can be done based on, on virtual insights and on modeling, and then it becomes prior art, precluding others from obtaining a patent, which is also one, one of the areas which is very active in IP and uh, where uh, materials modeling uh, can play a big role and in fact plays a big role as well. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, you can, we can go back even 20 years to um, uh, a, a study done then by IBC on the R&D process improvements uh, and find that these are still true today. Um, more efficient experimentation, more broader exploration, uh, ensuring that product development projects don't get stuck somewhere. Uh, so saving these projects and ensuring that they're guided in the right direction, accelerating them, improving safety and hazard uh, testing and hazard avoidance and um, uh, a substantial return on investment. But what, um, what, what is changing is, of course, also the environment in which this takes place and also the, um, the ability to more widely respond um, and, 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 uh, to the uh, complexities of materials that, uh, and, and challenges that are facing us today. And um, as was already mentioned in by Gabriele in the introduction and in the abstract, sustainability and digitalization are now key drivers. And in fact, we only have to go to the <clears throat> uh, different you know, websites from companies and just a selection of them. Uh, Johnson Matthew is catalyzing the net zero transition. BSF uh, is chemistry for a sustainable future. Uh, gearing our innovation pipelines to sustainability. Uh, Yumiko is becoming a sustainability champion. And uh, the European Assessment Framework for Safe and Sustainable by Design Chemicals and Materials um, is a, a recent development in a number of projects. And also startups such as Materials Nexus are using groundbreaking AI technology to discover superior novel materials in um, uh, for sustainability applications in particular. Uh, on the digitalization side, um, digitalization, what, it, what does it mean? It includes state exchange, but also um, new business model and also for BSF, even quantum computing. Uh, and uh, there are many drivers there and also many business opportunities as, as shown here in the, on the side of, of, of Bosch. 
the Strategic Materials Agenda, uh, published by the Advanced Materials Initiative 2030, uh, to which I have uh, had the honor to contribute also in my role as Executive Secretary of EMMC, emphasizes the digital technologies for materials, um, and in particular, um, them being a cross-sectorial enabler, meaning their integration along the value chain is, is key. And this is one of the things, one of the themes I'm going to pick up when we talk about now sustainability and digitalization. What does that really mean for materials modeling and uh, and, and, and how does that relate uh, to this agenda? And it's really this value chain integration and process uh, integration, which is one of the key aspects that we have to uh, have to consider. And I'm, I'm going to look at this from a number of different different facets. Um, I'm also going to use this term vertical and horizontal interoperability, uh, meaning vertic by vertical, we, we mean and it's also shown here horizontally, but often we, we, look, we kind of picture it vertically is the integration uh, of um, the, the multi multiple scales um, that a material has all the way to, to the product. Um, and this is also um, mapped onto quite often the supply chain uh, relationships, right? So um, you're dealing uh, as a supplier uh, of the of the material, of the chemistry, and so on, um, with the uh, more fine grained uh, chemi chemical structures, and then that goes all the way to uh, to the product. So that is what we call horizontal or interoperability in terms of the supply chain and vertical interoperability into, in terms of the material scales. Um, but that also relates to requirements and relates to optimization. And what is required today in terms of sustainability and breakthrough is, is really more breakthrough innovation uh, that cannot be achieved um, by simply changing a part um, or a component, it has to go all the way down to the material. And the challenge is how can that be achieved and how can that be supported uh, by materials modeling? So it's obviously a very high dimensional space with many options. Again, this is not nothing new. There is um, an aspect of that which I want to look at as well in terms of the, uh, the software and the markets, which um, which is shown in, in this slide as well, that goes back to um, uh, a, a contribution to the Integrated Computational Materials Engineering initiatives by um, colleagues from NASA, I believe, um, and that you also find um, in, in one of our reports. And this is um, the view that there is a um, handshake of materials um, knowledge uh, from the left-hand side, which typically deals with electronic, atomistic, mesoscopic, and continuum models and uh, related scales that designs the material. And then uh, once you go into computer-aided engineering, um, you have a material that you design with. So it's a design with the material. Um, and so there's a chain of structure and properties and performance that, um, that has to work more smoothly and in a more integrated way to achieve these breakthrough innovations and this horizontal interoperability that I have been talking about. When we speak about materials modeling, it's not only about the design of the material, it, it does extend uh, into the area of the designing with the material uh, by our definitions, as long as it contributes to the understanding, and it's mainly about the understanding and the data of the material behavior rather than the uh, part and component and assembly, et cetera, behavior. So when, when we talk about materials modeling and how does it relate to product design, we mean any type of, uh, of physics-based or data-based model being uh, these types of um, of models as has have been uh, defined and as kind of standardized also by uh, the EMMC and uh, related uh, set workshop agreements. Uh, and uh, it means also any scale, as long as the focus is on the material from chemistry to material behavior in process and product. 
if we look now what uh, is quite often um you know what is actually the material modeling part of that um we we see that in terms of software markets the materials modeling is uh, according to our estimates a has a market of about 600 million euros whereas the design of the products when it's really about computer aided engineering and no longer specifically about the material is about a tenfold market so the market sizes are indicators of the difference in perceived import importance still today despite the fact that to drive the sustainability agenda we need these breakthrough um, uh, innovations that really take the material into account so that a large part of, and also a large part of the product value is really inherent in the material. Um, I just put this out on the landscape as well because uh, we have a, a, a we also need to look at data and informatics uh, and of course we have now a lot of machine learning and AI uh, so materials modeling extends now between from the discrete continuum model surrogate models machine learning and, and, and AI and and then goes into the management of the data content and the, the information management uh, via the databases and also ontologies and we have been looking and uh, published a, a report on the on the software markets um, reviewing 98 providers in modeling and 38 in informatics and also included now for the first time five computing uh, quantum computing based providers with a focus on chemistry to come up with uh, with these market sizes so we see that in addition to um uh, to, to the markets in 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 in, in modeling and informatic uh, to, uh, in in discrete and continuum modeling, there is also now a, about 150 million of of informatics markets um, that we have to take care of or have to actually look into. Uh, but now coming back uh, again on my topic of integration, uh, what we see along the value chain is, of course. Um, as it's, I'll just go back, but it's, uh, I'm sure, clear to all of you that as we go towards the design with the material, then the continuum models play play the biggest role, right? Um, so we have, and what we what we see is we have another kind of distinction between continuum models and what we call the discrete models, um, into uh, that are you know electronic, atomistic, and mesoscopic models, also in terms of the markets uh, that we see there we see that the integration of discrete and continuum in terms of providers remains very rare. And in fact, all of, uh, all of the providers that include um, continuum and discrete modeling um, are, um, are larger companies. So uh, none of the, the really smaller companies have, have that level of that type of integration. Um, and um, what we uh, what we also see is that discrete modeling is you know um, well we also basically see the same story here that discrete modeling is dominated by SMEs. So if, um, of course, with all markets, it's true that the number of small companies is um, is dominant. That is true for any type of market. Um, uh, it's kind of an, always a long uh, tail of smaller companies even in more mature markets. But here we're looking not just as a, at the number of companies, but also their um, revenue share in terms of uh, the market size. And what we see here is for the, the discrete market, uh, 60, more than 60% um, of the size of the market in terms of euros is um, held by SMEs, uh, whereas, um, a, a large percent, uh, um, you know, 80% or so of, of the, the share of the continuum market uh, is held by large enterprises. So this is uh, still, um, you know, these so these gaps and this break in the value chain and uh, is, is, is pretty obvious from these types of fields. Uh, another um, aspect where, where we're looking at is the uh, machine learning and AI. Here we have focused on uh, companies that actually offer machine learning and, uh, and AI specific to materials, not general companies. 
Uh, and so this is still relatively small. Uh, and so it's interesting that most of the machine learning and AI that is used in industry and um, will be based on more generic tools rather than material specific tools. Although we will see that um, later on also and looking at the history that the success of machine learning and, and data modeling um, in the materials field is typically in a combination of using um, you know, physics insights and data together. So it lends itself for more, uh, more specific efforts in the field rather than more generic uh, tool usage, which is currently um, probably the dominant field. Um, so this is the, these are the sort of general scenarios. And now uh, when we want to look at how materials modeling is working for industry, um, I um, would like to introduce the dimensions of which we should uh, consider here. Um, we um, did a study on strategies for industry to engage in materials modeling, which also included a maturity model uh, for the application of, of modeling in industry. And uh, maturity models typically as shown on the, on the right hand side here, uh, show the level of maturity from initial typical ad hoc usage to <clears throat> uh, integrated and then managed and optimized, typically more transformative usage of a certain technology. Um, the, the other part of a maturity model is to have what we call dimensions of the maturity model. And here we're using the four dimensions of the people, the processes, the tools, and the data, so that we can get more of a, uh, a detailed assessment and handle on what is actually happening. Uh, so people are include the workforce, um, human resources, the interactions and training, the processes include the modeling workflows, the R&D processes, the supply chain processes, and the tools, of course, the modeling tools, uh, the simulation platforms, and then the data management analysis, metadata and ontologies and so on. Um, and th this is an overview. I won't dwell on that in the interest of time, but the slides will be made available as also in our report on um, how um, we actually structure and how we describe uh, the, the different maturity levels for the different dimensions. Uh, one of the interesting results I found um, from doing this based on uh, all industry data, uh, so maturity surveys and self-assessments done by a number of companies, is that the level of experience in the organization itself, not just by the individuals, plays a big role in terms of maturity. Organizations that have been do uh, doing materials modeling for more than 10 years typically show a larger level of maturity um, significantly in the people process and uh, tools, as well as the data dimensions, than um, those that are, are more new to the field. The biggest barriers in uh, remain uh, silos. Silos, uh, as, as uh, has been said many times in terms of, uh, of data, but that is also true for people processes and tools. People and competencies um, still remain somewhat siloed, and um, there are com sometimes communication issues about, for example, the value and what materials modeling can do uh, to others in the organization. Uh, silos in the process in terms of lack of uh, integration vertically and horizontally that I mentioned, and also while the multi-scale modeling integration is advancing, we still saw, um, for example, from the market analysis, a largely separate software communities uh, between, for example, discrete and continuum modeling. And even within companies that have offer both, uh, uh, there is these, these tend to be still quite separate um, you know, business units often. Uh, then we have a lack of, uh, of data integration that I will also um, come, hopefully, if I have time uh, um, on at the end. Um, so the process dimension uh, I'm going to look at. So the, uh, the impact of uh, integration into product development and supply chain interactions, i.e. Uh, an integration of the process dimension uh, 
can be significant. So uh, these are uh, some impact indicators from, from previous work uh, demonstrating also uh, competitive advantage and, and, and so on. Um, but what, what we have here looking at more recent um, uh, and, and current developments also related to digitalization, we, we have the, the view of a, a you know, sometimes called digital twins, sometimes called virtual development or virtual twins uh, that then support again that the high level objective agendas in terms of sustainability and efficiency. So this is an, an, an example from uh, Bosch virtualized engineering where we have the box here uh, that I highlighted at the, at the bottom right in terms of the multi-scale approach. So, um, so this means that this for this sort of thing to work, we need the digital simulation integration um, from the nano to the system scale. Um, and if that is then the case, um, as inter industry interviews have shown, we then have a reduced risk of failure. We have an improved level of, of control over processes. Um, and uh, we can actually support these types of virtual testing uh, and virtual product environments. Another example, also related to automotive is, um, is the virtual product and factory. Um, but there are many other examples um, in the industry. Uh, here I just have some quotes from Goodyear, Pirelli, Bridgestone uh, that have virtual modeling of tires, a, a new uh, simulation center opened at Goodyear uh, the, uh, and, and, and so on. So what is key here again is to achieve uh, sustainability in terms of performance and also in terms of um, not having to physically test um, very large numbers of, of tires uh, for car certifications and so on, which is again a sustainability issue in itself. And here we need again the chain of models that need to be integrated in order to deliver that. Um, but what, what we see typically around um, uh, and to, to go into what, what the issues are and the problems and, and the, the barriers that we still have, if we look at the integration optimization along the value chain, so we have here the raw material, processed materials and base chemicals, then specialty chemicals and performance materials, formulated materials and components as one way of looking at it. I mean, there are kind of... Uh, it, it's hard to do this in one dimension. It's, it's obviously a lot more compl complex than that. But uh, the point I want to make is that um, at the beginning and, that, and at the end, uh, we typically deal with some sort of materials data, but not really with chemistry information. Uh, whereas in the middle, we go towards a more detailed understanding of the chemistry and also the relevant data on the chemistry. Um, and these are important for, for discrete modeling. So the range in which I can do discrete modeling uh, uh, depends on having actually some knowledge about uh, the, uh, the, the materials and the chemicals in terms of their chemical structures, you know, atomistic structures, um, et, et cetera. At the start of the value chain, I may not have that because it's not being uh, characterized and determined enough. Um, at the towards the end of the value chain, I do not have that because typically this information is not shared once I go to formulate materials. So if I'm a, uh, if I go to to um, uh, um, if I if I ask a supplier for a material for a component, uh, that will not include uh, sufficient chemistry information to even do discrete modeling. So uh, this is one of the integration issues that we have is in terms of um, sharing. Uh, so, so the second point here is, is very important, data sharing along the value chain. So you need chemistry knowledge for discrete modeling and the lack of chemistry data sharing remains a major limitation in terms of industrial user base for discrete modeling. Only the central part of the value chain really can, can apply the models, not uh, because they wouldn't add value, but often because uh, that's the only part of the value chain where the sufficient information is available. Uh, the other part, if I pass on uh, along the value chain and also if I support virtual products, virtual factories and so on, I need standardized benchmarks 
benchmark tools. So they need to be trusted, they need to be managed uh, in terms of the models and also the modeling workloads. The people that communicate along that uh, need to also have that trust and need to act, know about enough about uh, what these what these models do and contribute. And um, uh, kind of the first point as as last, the modeling workflows need to be well managed in terms of their retrieval, their setup, their execution, their their optimization itself. Um, once I have that, I can go to the virtual product, which means faster, lower R&D, lower materials use, and really supporting the sustainability, optimized manufacturing, predictive maintenance and lifetime extension. Uh, so for example, I can integrate materials models and in-use data into digital twins, which enables um, lower maintenance. And also, for example, it's, uh, there are examples on wind turbines where I can then see, OK, I can run them for longer. Uh, I can uh, manage the uh, inspection intervals, and I can also integrate uh, the models into the products, as has been done um, in, in these examples where um, the, the modeling and simulation is really part of the product offering itself, uh, in particular in, in polymer and composite applications. Now, the people dimension. Um, uh, we pu recently published a paper on uh, advanced uh, uh, latest guidance for organizations tackling innovation challenges in manufacturing with an industry 5.0 context, i.e. bringing the human in, in the loop. Uh, so this, this gives some, some overview of that, where what I, what I need is the ability, again, to work together. I, I've, I've highlighted that. And I need this shared conceptualization of innovation cases, process and knowledge sources, including models. Uh, we have been working on that also within an, um, a project called Ontotrans, the open translation environment, where uh, this is one of the examples of uh, a resin uh, formulation and, and pre-preg in, in terms of um, <clears throat> bioresin developments. Um, and once I've got these types of conceptualization, here is from the Ontotrans, this is the, the composite pre preg but there have been other applications in the um, detergent systems with PNG and also um, steel section mills with ArcelorMittal. Um, I, I can have these types of workflows um, that I um, conceptualize as a, as a common way of um, understanding the innovation case and then relating properties um, that I can then determine, for example, by modeling that has been done here in the Ontotrans. Uh, so the modeling workflows uh, feed then into uh, the, the actual innovation challenge uh, via, these, via these property boxes for the processes and the materials. And so I can build a more interconnected system that supports um, the different, what, what materials modeling can do and also connects um, towards modeling workflows with industrial innovation workflows, right? which is uh, quite often the challenge and the common visualization and the common understanding as shown here on, on the right, uh, then supports the integrate the people dimension of understanding um, where the contributions can lie. Furthermore, uh, as I said, the simulations need to be managed um, this is uh, work that we're doing in, uh, in a project called Open Model, where we can then uh, represent uh, the workflows um, executables in terms of their uh, processes that, that happen during the workflow and the data that need to be managed during the workflow. Um, so I can then deal with the different tasks in a workflow in a multi-granular way. And part of that is uh, to drive um, the management of, of simulations, but um, in, in the sense that, um, you know, I sit there and I, um, I need to understand, okay, I have, I have seen this before, I have done this before, how can I uh, utilize past knowledge better um, to set up modeling workflows going forward? Uh, so in the interest of time, I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to skip uh, the details of the semantic representation, how we can uh, link that, but um, happy to discuss that later if, if there's time, just to come um, a bit to the tools dimension. <clears throat> um, 
There was a great talk by uh, Ms. Basava from uh, Johnson Mathie at the EMMC 2023 International Workshop, which highlighted um, the points of the integration of modeling experiments and characterization, and uh, the challenge being um, uh, the gaps in level of reality being uh, being closed. So the level of reality is one of the key topics in terms of um, industrial advances that have been taking place in recent years um, that again um, they're, 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 we, we often see the sort of the multi-scale picture um, but actually in terms of um, of, of, the, of the gap between the discrete modeling and, and, and the finite element modeling or let's say directly from uh, the scale that is required to make a realistic electronic model, um, th uh, th that's not often easily seen on that, right? So we need to have very large simulations also with um, large scale uh, quantum simulations, large uh, electronic models uh, and, and, uh, and atomistic models to get actually a, a, a realistic system. And I think this was published here together with um, University of Southampton. The other dimensions of that uh, that was mentioned there is, is the use of descriptors. So um, when I when I go to um, um, these these like uh, these realistic simulations, I can get the relevant insights, and the insights um, I translate into the detailed structural property uh, insights into the features that affect properties. This is what we call the descriptors. And then I can use these descriptors in database modeling together with machine learning and AI. So again, emphasizing here the, the value of the combination of the physics insight and the machine learning gives the, uh, the difference in, in materials modeling. Um, this is nothing new. Of course, machine learning and AI in materials modeling has a very long history with uh, QSPR relations since at least the early 1990s. Um, and even then, um, the combination of empirical and scientific knowledge and data was, was the key. Um, uh, I, I show here the group interaction modeling from, that uh, goes back to the late David Porter, uh, that doesn't uh, connect the chemical structure directly to a property via lots of data, but it connects uh, the chemical structure to um, um, uh, basically fitted equations of state from which the physical properties are derived. So, uh, and, and this intermediate level uh, is based on our knowledge of physics and um, the relevant physics contributions to the potential that I need to track. And um, this is done again also uh, today, if I go to uh, to machine learning uh, from, and, and, and the, the, the machine learning AI examples from current providers um, that, uh, you know, large companies that, that work in the, in the field, that yes, it's typically not a direct modeling of properties from some structure, but uh, using uh, empirical knowledge and, intermediate um, functions and functionals um, as a pathway to, to the property. Um, some of the outstanding materials modeling challenge remain um, because of the complexity of materials we're dealing with. And, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, it's to some extent also moving goalposts. We, uh, that's why that what is true in 2004 is also probably still true today. Um, our models, and, and capabilities have, have increased along that line, but also the, uh, the complexity of what, what we want to achieve has increased. So we're dealing with um, more and more disordered materials. We're dealing with large configuration spaces and phase-based sampling is out of reach. We're dealing with nanostructures and nanophase segregation and fast processes. We still need uh, predictive chemical accuracy, for example, in, ex in excited state spectra. And also if we want to determine the kinetics, for example, in, in terms of catalysis, uh, we do not have today the predictive chemical accuracy uh, to predict kinetics over um, 
any reasonable uh, scale. Uh, we're dealing with highly correlated systems and um, here are examples uh, that were given also in a Jane presentation by re in the recent quantum computing conference uh, in terms of, you know, what are the dopants? Um, how do I include F-band shifts to, due to oxygen vacancy? So these complexities we are, we are dealing with now and uh, the accuracy would be a game changer. And this is now on, on the cards, at least in, well, it will still take some time, but, you know, uh, with uh, quantum computing potentially for materials uh, design. Where the higher accuracy is really what is what is sought after, uh, rather than necessarily higher speed. There is, a, uh, in terms of industry, there is significant industry interest because of its potential and also investment. However, um, as um, um, you know, we pointed out, we uh, gave a poster at this uh, conference. Um, uh, in in a kind of reverse scenario uh, where you not normally have a lot of um, the, the, the market in the continuum modeling, we have the computing quantum computing materials modeling really focused mostly on the electronic modeling. And of course, the question is, when does that have an impact across the, the, the workflow and all of the methods in materials modeling? Uh, now, finally, the, the data dimension is, again, nothing new. Um, here we're talking about um, well uh, about a decade uh, of product to chemistry data integration. If I consider uh, uh, the date of the uh, a patent uh, by Boeing on a product to chemical continuum data system as a, you know kind of one relevant date in that, and um, many years ago also we already wrote a blog on on this one. Um, and that remains the shared vision, the vision of a shared knowledge generation and exploitation and integration. And uh, this is from some EMMC data on that, establishing a materials commons around that. Uh, and uh, again, from the EMMC roadmap to have um, a virtuous cycle of materials digitalization that uh, revolves around this data integration, uh, meaning um, that the generation of new data, for example, from modeling and also from characterization will be uh, documented in a coherent way so that it can be integrated with all of the other activities. However, the challenge remains that uh, materials and product development draw on very different types of subdomains and each subdomain has its own language, its own way of handling data and uh, its own way of representing data, i.e. its own type of metadata with a lack of a common representation system. So we need to organize the materials data from a foundational perspective. Um, I also want to kind of advertise here a, uh, uh, some new efforts in this field, which, which are based on our analysis of material science terminologies and ontologies that show that there is a lack of, this lack of agreed conceptualization and terminologies and a low fair score of many semantic assets. And what I wanted to advertise is this uh, Research Data Alliance Working Group, which I co-chair, uh, that will have its, its kickoff meeting at the uh, virtual uh, RDA plenary, the 22nd plenary, which will take place over the next week and the week after online. So uh, please check out this link and also um, contribute to the working group as we go forward which is aiming to collect and review existing vocabularies, terminologies, and schema for material science and cognate domains, domains and propose really a harmonization uh, of efforts for that. Uh, what we are doing in the field um, is develop the um, MO ontology of which um, you probably have heard about um, as a way of integrating, again, the what I said at the beginning, the vertical, and the horizontal, so the vertical scale dimension and the, and the horizontal um, uh, supply chain and um, um, value chain uh, domains um, in one uh, system. So representing the world in MO um, enables this vertical integration, for example, really all the way from the standard model to the universe um, is the claim. So we, we see this uh, in this graph here, so we have the materials chemistry on the bottom, and that is connected to the physics and chemical physics, and in fact, to the standard model 
of particles and to what we call the mirror causality level. Um, so I want to finish off with um, uh, um, showing how one can then look at and, and assess industrial impact in industry organization. Uh, so th this is the framework that we use with, uh, with our clients, which is the impact assessment that goes back to the um, so-called quantitative benchmark uh, for time to, to market um, approach from the um, materials genome initiative, identifying um, the activities in along the value chain uh, from design, development, manufacturing, but that can be uh, adjusted to uh, the needs of, of the industry and then identifying where are the accelerators and where are the inhibitors as was done by the MGI here for the, uh, for the case of the uh, Gorilla Glass, which we all have on our mobile phones um, and uh, how that was accelerated. Um, from uh, for the Gorilla Glass three, for example, to two, 22 months uh, instead of five years for it, for the original case by um, capabilities in terms of modeling experience uh, and and the availability of models and and what what we have said before the integration of um, of the processes and and workflow along the value chain. Uh, so. Uh, finishing off with some observations and recommendations for processes, people, data, and tools. Uh, models need to be well integrated into the workflows and the value chains, and the um, people need to, um, where we see the, we still have the expert modelers remain as a major uh, impact factor, but democratization is, is a key goal and is being realized. Uh, we need to integrate better with the data uh, and have common data models, reference ontologies, and uh, and tools that um, have the right level of benchmarking to be integrated into the virtual products. So um, the impacts have been demonstrated, and the range of um, of um, um, impact factors have been analyzed. Um, and we see here again the flow of information, the interconnected modeling and characterization is, is the key. Uh, that will also then lead to the next step, steps towards impact. I won't dwell on, on that and really going uh, to an organization um, that has um, you know, a systematic approach to, to innovation management driven by, by modeling and data. So from uh, heroes to that type of management, which is always the, being the key. And I would like to thank you for your attention. I'm happy to ask, answer any questions. There are some uh, links to our website and also um, LinkedIn profile. And also I would like to thank uh, the European uh, Commission for the funding uh, of the Open Model and the Ontotrans project. Thank you.